I'm Rev. Chad Polden, pastor and teacher here at All Souls Congregational Church, and I wanted to take just a moment and say welcome. Whether you're watching this video during its Sunday morning premiere or watching at another time, I am so glad that you are. This video is the second installment in a series of special worship videos we're producing for you while in-person programming and public worship services in our meeting house remain suspended. If you are visiting with us, for lack of a better phrase, I encourage you to visit allsoulsbangor.com slash visitors. We would love to know who you are and look forward to the opportunity to welcome you in person when this crisis is passed. I remind all of our members and friends that you can still support the staff and ministries of this church even from afar. We have a number of alternative giving methods available to you. Uh, those include a portal on our website, uh, you can also download the app Give Plus. Uh, that app is available on Google Play, iTunes, wherever you get apps for your mobile device. Uh, those are incredibly easy to use. They're convenient. Uh, you may even discover that you want to continue using them uh, even after we are gathering in our meeting house once more. Those things said, let me offer just a few notes on today's worship video. First of all, I am so pleased to be able to tell you that a number of young people, with the help of their parents, uh, will be offering uh, the Lord's Prayer as part of this worship video. It was a wonderful way to engage uh, those young people and their families during this time. Next week is Palm Sunday, and I hope to put together a virtual processional, and I would invite uh, those families to participate in that effort as well. In fact, I would invite you all to do so. Uh, Lindsay Bennett, uh, our church school coordinator, has some directions on how to make a palm uh, at home, uh, but creativity is welcome. Any little bit of greenery will do. Uh, perhaps you've got a spider plant that's a bit out of control and needs some pruning anyway. Uh, that will suffice. Uh, look for more information on Facebook. Uh, we'll also be contacting folks via email uh, as uh, the new week unfolds. I also want to mention one of the pieces of music that's included in today's video. That uh, piece of music was submitted to me by Peter Verlee. Uh, and uh, I wanted to mention, because it would not be obvious by the video, uh, that Peter is in fact singing all of the parts uh, for that song. Uh, it's kind of neat. Uh, well done. Thank you for sharing that with us. We continue now with a prelude to prepare our hearts uh, to truly be in a place of worship. As we listen to that prelude, uh, we'll be seeing pictures of the church. And as you see those pictures, you may think to yourself, but pastor, those are just pictures of people. Yes, yes they are. As has been the case since the Holy Spirit called the church into being on Pentecost Day, the church is not a building. The church is the people. We are the body of Christ. And though we cannot currently gather in our meeting house, we remain the church. Let us remember that and let us seek to do the work of the church always. Thank you again for joining us, for watching this video. I hope it is a blessing to you. Stay well, and God bless.
let us worship God who is enthroned forever and whose name endures for all generations. The Lord is our refuge, a very present help in trouble. God sustains us in this present age and comes to make all things new. Let us worship the Lord our God. Let us join our hearts in prayer. These are difficult times, O Lord. Jesus told us we would face them, such as life in this fallen world. Grant us sufficient faith that we might trust you in the midst of all circumstances. Keep us from discouragement and despair. Assure us once more that your good purposes for creation and for our lives remain. Lord, we look to you. We lift up our eyes to the hills from whence our help comes. We yearn for that day when at last all things will be made new. Until then, grant your people a right, willing, and courageous spirit that we might be faithful even as you are always faithful to us. Amen. I saw the Lord seated on the throne, exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple with glory, and the whole earth is filled, and the whole earth is filled, and the whole is filled with his glory. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord. Holy, I'm crying, holy. saw the Lord seated on the throne, exalted. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 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 Good job. Before they all run off to Sunday school or to the other room, as the case might be today, I want to take a moment and talk to any young people who might be watching right now. First of all, thank you. Thank you to all of you who helped to offer the Lord's Prayer for us today. That is such an important prayer. It is a prayer that children have been learning long before your parents were even born, long before your grandparents were even born, long before your great, 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 great grandparents were even born. It is a prayer that Jesus taught his closest friends himself. And now you're learning that prayer because you too are Jesus' friend. You did a great job and I'm proud of each and every one of you. I can also tell you that it meant a great deal to all those who are watching to have been able to see you today. You are an important part of God's family. You are an important part of our church family. And that is true whether you were in the video today or not. To all of the children watching, please hear me when I say to you that you are so very important to us. You know, at one point when Jesus was preaching and teaching, people started bringing children to him that they might bless them. But others said, oh, stop, stop, leave Jesus alone. Don't bother him with these children. But Jesus insisted. 
Jesus insisted, saying, let the children come to me, for to such belong the kingdom of God. Jesus recognized how very important that you are. We do too, and we miss you. Maybe you are missing some people right now too, friends from school or others that you play with. Maybe you're older and you don't play anymore, but I bet there are some folks that you hang out with that you are missing right now. We're all missing some people these days, and that can be hard. It can be hard for all of us, for children and for adults too. So be patient with one another, with your brothers, with your sisters, with your parents, Help one another, play games, read stories, make a meal together, do all these things and more. Make wonderful memories that you will have long after these days are done. And know all the while that your church family misses you and that we are eager. We are eager to be with you again here in this place. Until then, remember the words we so often say to you when you are here with us, that God loves the world and all its people, and that God loves you. God loves you, and we do too. Let us listen for the word of God. First, a reading from the book of Psalms, chapter 102, verses 12 through 17. But you, O Lord, are enthroned forever. Your name endures to all generations. You will rise up and have compassion on Zion, for it is time to favor it. The appointed time has come. For your servants hold its stones dear, and have pity on its dust. The nations will fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory. For the Lord will build up Zion. He will appear in his glory. He will regard the prayer of the destitute and will not despise their prayer. From the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, beginning with verse 1. Listen again for the word of God. As he came out of the temple... One of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. We continue reading in verse 32. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be aware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey, when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake.
Let us pray. Gracious God, be with me here in this place. Be with all those who are watching. By your Spirit, guide the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts, that they might be acceptable in your sight, our Rock and Redeemer. Amen. You know, most of the disciples weren't from Jerusalem. Some may have had ties to Jerusalem, but the disciples themselves came from smaller communities, places like Bethsaida and Cana. Not that they hadn't been to Jerusalem before, but despite any previous visit, there remained for them a bit of novelty to the place, sights that couldn't be seen elsewhere, things that still caught their attention. I've been to Boston many times, yet I still find myself looking around at the architecture. I still find myself taking note of the sounds and smells of the city. No doubt things are very still there at this moment. Yet this idea still helps to put in perspective the opening verses of our reading today. We find ourselves in the 13th chapter of Mark, and at this point in Mark's gospel, Jesus is already in Jerusalem we're actually going to backtrack a little bit next week for Palm Sunday, but in today's reading, we are already there. And as they are leaving the temple, the disciples are looking around like you and I might do in a big city, and at one point, one of them exclaims, Look, Jesus, and we might imagine him pointing as he speaks, Look, Jesus, look at the stones, look at the buildings, they're ginormous. And yes, that is a rather modern translation. The Pastor Chad translation, you might say, but it is spot on, I assure you. The temple was an impressive place. The western stone, part of the still standing foundational layer of the western wall, the wailing wall as some call it, that wall includes one stone 39 feet long, 9 feet high, and up to 8 feet deep. It is estimated to weigh in at over 500 tons. Other stones come in weighing a merely 80 tons, and some of those can be found 100 feet up. It is a marvel of ancient masonry and engineering. And again, I have no doubt that all of the disciples had seen it before, but it was one of those things that never failed to impress, one of those things that was always worthy of note. Also worthy of note is Jesus' response not one stone will be left here upon another, he says. All will be thrown down, indicating the destruction of the temple. And so begins Mark's little apocalypse, as it is sometimes called. Matthew has one too, as does the Gospel of Luke. These sections of Scripture contain language with which we modern Christians are not always so comfortable we shared but two excerpts from Mark 13 this morning, but in between those excerpts we find verses about the sun being darkened, the stars falling from heaven, and the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power. Language that points us to the coming of the kingdom of God. We prefer to talk about the kingdom of God as simply being heaven, not something that shows up and disrupts everything we take for granted and overturns what seems so permanent to us. We want to speak about our going into the kingdom with ease after a long and pleasant life, not a cataclysmic coming of that kingdom that interrupts our world and lives. Such talk makes us uncomfortable, at least. Looking at the larger apocalyptic sections of Scripture, Prophets like Ezekiel, Daniel, and of course the book of Revelation, we find more examples of cataclysmic language and imagery that feel foreign and inaccessible to us. We aren't sure what to make of them, and so often we just don't pay attention to them. But to do so is to give up on one of the central hopes of the Christian faith. The hope to which I am referring is not the cataclysm, but the reordering and the restoration that always follow. Such passages do indeed use very different language than we might use today, but always, always the big picture message at the heart of those books and passages is a hope that God will set things right, that one day God will set all things right. And the inescapable reality is that if God is going to set things right, it may very well feel like a cataclysm. 
Now, why would I say such a thing? I say this because setting things right requires undoing what is wrong, and there is so much that is wrong. And what is wrong is woven so deeply into our world and lives. As frightening and as foreign as this apocalyptic writing might be, it conveys the reality that if God today were to come and bring the kingdom to bear, if God were to bring to its culmination the redemption of all things, so much of what we know and so much of what we take for granted, even that which seems as immovable as a stone that weighs hundreds of tons, if God were to come today and set all things right and cast out even evil's shadow, so much of what we know, so much of what we take for granted, so much of what we've grown accustomed to, so much of what we unwittingly sustain and that in which we ourselves engage would by necessity be overturned and undone. Now one could argue that I am making too much of this little passage here in Mark's Gospel, that it's really just about the temple. The Wailing Wall, which I mentioned earlier, is called the Wailing Wall because that is all that is left. Within a generation of Jesus, the temple was destroyed during the Roman Jewish War. Important because in verse 30, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all of these things take place. The historian Josephus even records reports of sounds like trumpets coming out of the heavens while all of this is unfolding. And so again, one can certainly make an argument that Jesus is speaking to a particular and now historical event. And you can do the same with these other apocalyptic writings. But even if that is the case, even if we can ground such passages and now historical events, that history becomes an archetype for something more universal and profound, how God in the wake of chaos reorders and restores. As a whole, these passages point us toward that final and future hope which has always been part of the Christian confession and that hope I speak of, again, it is not the unrest. The hope is not the foundations being dug up or the walls being torn down. The hope is not the cataclysm. The hope of which I spoke is in a restoration that follows. The hope is for the culmination of God's redemptive work and the reconciliation of all things unto God's self. And God so often uses those cataclysms to do just that. God steps into uh, all that goes wrong in our world and uses it to redeem and to restore. The hope is the coming of the kingdom in all of its fullness But the coming of that kingdom in all of its fullness will require a radical reordering of our world and lives, of our hearts and minds. And that is really the first point that I want to make to you today. That the coming of the kingdom in all of its fullness will require a radical reordering of our world and of our lives, of our hearts and our minds. Now that principle remains true even if we aren't talking about the kingdom coming in all of its fullness, even if we're just talking about the kingdom coming a little more fully into our hearts, lives, and world, even then, always, the coming of the kingdom requires a reordering. Always the coming of the kingdom requires a reordering, and not even that which seems solid, fixed, and immovable is immune. Now, I realize, as mentioned earlier, that I may be talking about the kingdom in a different way than you are accustomed. We often think of the kingdom as some place over there or up there, perhaps, some place we get to go to when we die. But that word kingdom, basileia in the Greek, has two distinct meanings. It is both a place But the word also refers to something more intangible, namely the rule of God. And when the rule of God comes into a place where it was not, there will be along with it a disruption of the status quo. 
even if we want to keep to the notion of the kingdom as some place we get to go to after this life, even that requires a reordering, though we might call it transformation. As Christians, we are called to start that process now. We call it discipleship, but that good work which God has begun in us, in us God Himself will bring to com completion. That's from Philippians 1.6. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So even getting from here to there requires radical change. We will still be us, but we will not be the same. A mystery indeed. But the kingdom isn't just a place to which we escape as Christians after this life. The kingdom is something that draws near to us now and one day will transform all of creation. And the kingdom is something we are meant to invite and to draw into our world and lives now. It is something we are meant to welcome into our world and lives now. And this too will require a disruption. For the kingdom for the rule of God to take hold of our lives in new ways. That will require a disruption that might not always be easy or pleasant. Perhaps a disruption of our routines as we seek to offer more of our lives and service to others. Perhaps a disruption of our sometimes thoughtless participation in the economic marketplace as we seek to avoid the exploitation of others and shop accordingly. Perhaps a disruption of assumptions and perspectives as we, see, as we begin to see others, all others, as beloved by God and as bearing God's image no less than we do ourselves. All of these things are in keeping with God's will. All of these things are in keeping. They reflect what would be God's rule, and in that sense, they are kingdom things. If you are serious about inviting the kingdom into your life, expect disruption. It may even turn things upside down in ways you did not expect. When we invite God to bring His rule, his kingdom to bear upon our lives, sometimes even what we thought were foundational stones, walls which we have painstakingly constructed, sometimes even they must be dug up, overturned, and cast down. Such is the coming of the kingdom of God. Doing what is right, doing what is just, surely these are kingdom things as well. Surely these reflect the will, the desire, the rule of God. Doing what is right, doing what is just, that too sometimes requires a disruption of our lives. We know that to be true right now, perhaps more than we have for some time. All that we are experiencing right now is an effort to protect the most vulnerable, it is an effort to ensure that our health system isn't overwhelmed. It is an effort to ensure that those who need medical intervention can get it and that those whose health is already compromised do not suffer for more severe or even deadly outcomes. These goals are kingdom goals. Caring for the least of these, tending the sick, these are kingdom things. And as, as is so often the case, our living into that kingdom requires a reordering of our lives. And let me share a hope. My hope is that while our lives are disrupted, God will reorder our lives further still in ways we did not foresee or intend. Now let me be very clear at this point in no way do I mean to suggest that the current crisis is one imposed upon us by God so that God might then reorder our lives. That is not what I am saying. What I am saying is that the reordering, 
which we for the present moment have embraced, is in keeping with kingdom ideals. Specific policy is something that can always be debated, but the goal, which for the moment seems to be uniting so much of our nation and our world, the goal is right and it is just and it is in keeping with kingdom principles. What I am also saying is that despite the inconveniences and even hardships we presently endure, there is, in the midst of all of this, there is an opportunity for the kingdom, that is the rule of God, to take root in our lives, in our minds, in our homes, in ways we do not expect. This is what God does. God takes the rubble of human lives and constructs from them a temple. When the status quo is overturned, there is at that point an opportunity for something new. When one stone is overturned, there is an opportunity to lay them back together in a whole new way or lay another stone entirely. You know, I have been long concerned for the overwhelming schedule of young families. Perhaps this is an opportunity for those families to reconnect, to spend time together, to build relationships in ways that have previously eluded you. Perhaps there are couples who have been struggling. Perhaps this social distancing will actually bring you closer together as you have the opportunity for honest conversation, as you have the opportunity to practice forgiveness and compromise. Perhaps we as a society will put aside some of the elitism that has often dismissed certain occupations and those who engage in them as less important. I can't tell you how often I have been told I don't have time for a prayer life. Perhaps you do now. Perhaps this is a moment for us, for each of us, for all of us. While the soil is overturned, Let us sow seeds and invite God to give them growth and bring them to flower even after this crisis has passed. When the time comes, in fact, let us resist resuming old routines thoughtlessly. Let us instead open our doors and step out into new ones that reflect more fully the ideals of God's kingdom that reflect more fully God's rule coming to bear on our lives. Again, the coming of God's kingdom always requires a reordering. It always requires a bit of disruption. So since our lives are at the moment already disrupted, since they're already disrupted, let us invite God to use these moments to reorder them. As our young people shared with us this morning, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Let us pray. Lord God, your son Jesus told us to keep awake, to watch for your coming. Come to us even now. We are eager to receive you. These are difficult times, yet help us to see in them opportunities to grow as your people, opportunities to welcome your rule and to embrace more fully your kingdom. There are so many right now confined to homes, so many confined to small and close-knit circles. When at last the doors are opened and the boundaries loosed, May those we encounter find us different men and women than we were before. Use this, O Lord. Use even this to transform your people and our culture that we might bear with ever-increasing glory the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. We pray for all our brothers and sisters. We pray for our community, 
our state, our nation, our world. We pray for those who are feeling overwhelmed, anxious, and even fearful. Grant them courage. We pray for the sick and for those who care for them. We pray for those separated from loved ones who are in nursing homes and hospitals. We pray for those who mourn. In the midst of all this trouble and trial, help us to discern your presence at work in our midst. Hear us now as we continue to pray in silence. Come, O Spirit, come. Build your kingdom upon this earth. Begin in our very hearts. In the name of Jesus, who even now reigns over all things. Amen. And amen. Pray that you and your loved ones are healthy and well. Regardless of what the future may hold, let us all, always, let us seek the presence of God. Let us seek to live more fully as citizens of that coming kingdom. And let us open our hearts to the working of God, that he by his Holy Spirit may indeed reorder our lives, our hearts, and our minds. God bless you, and may the peace of Christ be with you. Amen.